Hello and welcome to the Youth News Program, News for Our Future, where young people discuss current events and how we see them. I'm your host, Aurelia Corsand. With me today is Fadi Hakim, a sophomore at Carleton College in Minnesota, Jason Hahn, a junior at Yorktown High School, Chai Young Lee, a freshman at James Madison University, and Angeline Sion, a graduate of Vanderbilt University with a master's degree in chemical engineering. Welcome, everyone. Thank you. All right, you. so let's get started. A fiery topic that has been in the news is Arizona's immigration policy. This subject is swirling with controversy. This law would require immigrants to carry their immigration papers at all times and gives police the power to detain anyone suspected of being in the United States illegally. A federal judge has recently appealed this law and the state of the law is pending. So what are your thoughts on this law? Well, it's interesting to note that, you know, the bill was signed in April and more recently has reappeared because of the federal uh, district judge actually ruled out some of the most controversial parts of the bill. And currently, uh, the federal government supports that decision and their argument is that um, the if the Arizona takes matters into their own hands, it will be basically intervening with, you know, powers that the federal government should exercise only. And the uh, supporters of the bill are actually claiming that, that that is not the case and that, you know, they're just trying to take action because the federal government has failed in their immigration enforcement. And there's a lot of speculation that this will go on to the Supreme Court and it will be interesting to see how it all plays out. I believe it wouldn't be, uh, illegal immigration wouldn't be nearly as big a problem if it was, if naturalization was easier for immigrants because then they wouldn't have to immigrate illegally if it was easy for them just to legally immigrate. Yeah, yeah I would definitely agree with um, what Jason has proposed and there's been um, a lack of clear focus on this issue of illegal immigration since although most of the attention has been directed to minor but well publicized events of um, criminal acts conducted by um, illegal immigrants I think it's more of a matter of uh, documenting people and making sure that people are known by the government that they are living in the United States rather than illegal immigrants as being um, as being people who are li more likely to do criminal acts which is I believe is not always true and I guess many people would also believe to that and the state bill 1070 which um, states attrition through enforcement um, is would probably be unsuccessful because of because um, of its strength to solve this issue as for example if I'm to make an analogy of this issue as draining a sink but without paying attention to how much water you put from the faucet and it's not paying attention to the source of illegal immigration. I mean, Arizona is definitely impacted because it's an entry point and a lot of violence and might, might take place there, but still the economy of the country is dependent, especially the agriculture sector and certain manufacturing industries. And since it is difficult to change the system, it is indeed um, beneficial to ease naturalization or my idea is somewhat similar, but it is that since they're undocumented, providing them legal standing as long as they pay a certain amount of taxes, which is a kind of a more responsibly for someone who is in a country, would also be a good idea. Yeah, I think I think uh, you hit on some good points, Fadi. Um, Thank you. I think uh, one of the issues is uh, that a lot of people are worried about is the impact that that an influx of people immigrating to America would have um, that uh, I think if you really look at the heart of the issue like you were talking about the economics um, what what would really help is if we look at why a lot of the people a lot of the illegal immigrants immigrate here is because the situations in their own countries are really bad and like you said going through the normal process of becoming a citizen or coming here there's such high barriers um, so one way to address that would be to reduce the barriers and another way would be that I think would be more effective and more sustainable is um, to focus on helping the economies of the countries that are that are suffering so bad so it's kind of from the 10,000 foot perspective um, I know we, we don't like to just send money overseas but 
when you think about spending billions of dollars on a fence <laughs> between borders versus spending billions of dollars to help stimulate economies, uh, one's going to be a little more sustainable than the other, I think. It's an interesting perspective. Um, I just have a, I guess, going back to what Chai said about how this is probably going to end up in the Supreme Court, and there's been speculation that that's going to be the case. And I especially think so since other states have been looking at this bill and saying, well, maybe we can use that over here. I know in Virginia there has been rumors, there have been rumors that maybe something like this law is going to happen in Virginia. So do you guys think that it is going to come to the Supreme Court? And what are going to be other states' reactions? And are we going to see this in more places? Yeah, the definitely. I definitely think that, uh, considering the fact that you know this has received so much attention, and you know all these other states are considering in passing similar laws. I mean, it's already affecting like many activities and like some parts of the economy as well. Because when the Arizona bill was you know signed, there were reports of you know people just trying to move out with their families from Arizona. And recently, I was reading a, a post article today. And you know, there were, in Virginia, there's a similar law, you know, being considered. And like, there was a huge festival involving um, Hispanic Americans, and you know, and not a, not a lot of people actually showed up because you know, compared to other years in the past. So it's definitely taking, uh, you know, impacting a lot of aspects of society, and I think it will definitely eventually end up, you know, in the highest Supreme Court. So unless it gets reformed before then. True. Right. I know that uh, one of the concerns about this bill um, that the opponents of the bill have set forth is that it's going to promote racial profiling because, I mean, in Arizona, most of the immigrants are from Mexico. So what are your thoughts on this and how, how could that be avoided or can it be avoided? Well, they did, in the, in, when they reformed the language of the bill, they did strike it out so that it, you phys couldn't officially racial, racially profile, but, um, and I also read an article that they were doing training for officers so that they wouldn't racial profile. <laughs> um, but, but it is kind of hard because obviously immigrants, most illegal immigrants in Arizona would be um, Hispanic, typically Mexican, so it, it does seem like you're just setting yourself up to for that type of thing to happen. Okay. Well, those are some interesting points about the immigration law, and it'll be interesting to see how this all pans out. Mm -hmm. Well, our second topic is one that has always been of concern, especially to educators and students, plagiarism. This has recently been in the news because some people speculate that as children grow up with the internet and all these different technological advances, they have fewer and fewer qualms about copying and pasting work that is not their own and pretending, pretending that that work is their own. This is something that I personally, as a student, um, has, have witnessed this as uh, people from my university are expelled for cheating. So what do you guys think about this problem? Well, it's very interesting since nowadays knowledge has less and less physical presence. In once in the past, you might have to go to the library, find a book, and hold the book in your hands. And, and it's, it's, it's certainly a different experience from typing something to Google or Wikipedia. I mean, people nowadays, probably when they're in sort of an informal meeting, when a speaker comes up with a term that they don't know, you can just spend four seconds Googling, and there we go. There's the answer. It's instant. It's free. And so, and there's no author that claims um, that claims and claim to that claims originality over that that statement, and so it's a very very different world. And I guess this implies that there is a transition for the whole academic world, and not just for the students, to being very accessible online. And this certainly is something to pay attention to. And and definitely. One of the short-term solutions we can propose is that we can, um, there should be more guidelines on the referencing styles and on how to cite online sources, especially when they are anonymous. Since I guess this is a, a, a problem that many students in the high school and college age, or even middle school age, face. 
And of course, in the long term, there could be more adaptation to how probably teachers can teach um, their students and how to evaluate the credibility of their sources. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. I think, you know, setting up that strong foundation and, you know, encouraging good, you know, habits early on will definitely encourage, you know, students to not plagiarize, you know, in college and university. Um, and, you know, I, uh, another thing I also noticed was that, you know, a lot of times, you know, students, because of they've been so exposed to using the internet all the time, you know, a lot of times they do know that, you know, what they're doing is wrong, they're just too lazy. Because there was a article, uh, in the article I read, uh, a study at the University of California, Davis, and they studied 196, you know, plagiarism cases, and most did not involve students who were ignorant of the needs to credit writing of others. So they knew they were doing stuff wrong. They were just too lazy. So I think that's one problem that needs, you know, to be, uh, you know, dealt with. Also, it can be hard to cite a website or another online source mm -hmm. because not all the time, uh, people don't always put authors on the web pages. And a lot of times, websites just copy from other sites and have their own citations at the bottom of a page or hidden somewhere else on the site. And it can be incredibly difficult to actually trace back the original author for your paper. So I think maybe teachers need to lower their, sta lower their standards for website citation in their papers because you might accidentally not get everything right and the teacher will yell at you and you don't want to be expelled no. for an accident. Yeah. Well maybe, I mean, I guess you could say that the teachers should lower their standards but maybe you should, maybe we can also say maybe the students should, yeah. should not be citing so many web sources that have questionable credibility and um, going back to the books, I know once, mm -hmm. once I God, like when I started going to college, I realized that more so than high school, um, professors expected you to use real books and works from researchers and a lot more credible site, uh, sources and websites were looked down upon. So perhaps if in high school they could stress that websites aren't necessarily the best way to go. I know that my project, projects would say you should have at least two books. Maybe they should say instead you should have at maximum two websites. Mm -hmm. I think Fadi brought up a good point that we just need to, um, well, so everybody, <laughs> we just need to uh, really teach how to cite websites early on and, and teach that it's really important in, ter in terms of when people are using information from the web because it is easy just to cut and paste. And I don't think that since it's been such a fast transition from mostly citing books to all of a sudden citing the internet so frequently, I don't think there's been time to really develop a good way of teaching people how to properly cite. Um, and so I think if we started doing that very early on, we're starting to teach kids how to use computers at a very young age, so we need to also start teaching them um, how to cite things at a very young mm -hmm. age, I think, to help and understand that. And I also think, you know, maybe adding on to that, you could set tougher restrictions because, you know, I, I remember, you know, when I was in high school, a freshman in high school. Our teacher, you know, you know turnitin.com, where, you know, students have to submit their papers, and it scans the internet for any, like, similarities in their writing. And, you know, I had a friend who got a zero because of that, and that, you know, discouraged me from ever trying to copy and paste. So I think that's something that could be done as well. I mean, at my university, if you're, if you're caught cheating or plagiarizing once, you're out, no questions. Yeah. So that's terrifying. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I could never think of that, my friends and I. Just, it's just not an option to take mm -hmm. someone else's work. And yeah, we, and still, we, we have to remember, I guess, that in this era where everyone is flooded with information, it's getting harder and harder to become original and to be authentic mm -hmm. since since you're always they since you since there are always so many sources from which you can get awesome ideas from it's getting more tempting to say um i also contributed to that but <laughs> in, in actuality it's only something that's posted in the website by an anonymous author and so i guess i guess it's something that both our teachers and educators as well as young people should um work together with on Hopefully, plagiarism won't be as big of an issue in the future. <laughs> we can get past yeah. this. 
So something that isn't really a current event, but an interesting new concept is the trickle-up theory set forth by Stuart Hart, a professor at Cornell University. There was recently an article in the New York Times explaining this theory. Put simply, this idea stresses beginning development at the lower levels of the economy instead of trickling down from the top. This can apply to international development as it stresses that global focus should be on developing countries instead of developed countries as models for sustainable growth. So what are your thoughts on this theory and how can it apply to our world now? Oh, am I going first? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think it's uh, in our world, actually, even the West is starting to, to look in that, that same mindset in, in terms of how can we um, kind of do more with less, how can we decentralize energy systems. Um, I've even heard talk of decentralizing water systems. So I think, um, I think it's, I, when, I, when I read about that theory, I thought it made a lot of sense. Um, you also see a lot of uh, the Western world investing, they're investing in those, that technology that's being brought to um, the uh, more developing countries. Um, and so I think, yeah, I think just in, in the experiences that I've had in traveling, seeing, um, you know, certain basic, you know, solar solar panels being used in developing countries and things like that. It's um, it makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah, and that idea of having, um, for example, water purification at the point and having decentralized generation of power, as um, also points out to the idea that these approaches to economic development might be more sustainable in the future since um, things that are um, suited to the needs of developing countries take into account, for example, um, the limited capability of people to buy natural resources and low accessibility to infrastructure and transportation compared to, um, for example, in the more industrialized countries in, the Euro in Europe and North America. And encouraging products to adopt to these markets would still find um, some niche in, in the developed countries that might be unexpected. For, for example, the General Electric's company has developed a portable ultrasound device that's been used by doctors in rural China, as well as a mobile electrocardiogram um, device that's been used by doctors in rural India. And in the United States, these devices have been used by um, paramedics in emergency situations, which is of course um, not the exact not the exact same function they were um, they were um, planned for, but still they occupy a very a very reliable niche in the market, and so I guess it would still bring sufficient incentives for companies to start thinking. Um, um, using this approach. And it is definitely very interesting because it sort of modifies globalization. When you see um, all the trends started by globalization, for example, um, the internet and um, using cars, they all started from all these rich countries. And, and they begin to spread out to other countries as they become more affluent and as they um, gain more disposable income. But here, it's totally the opposite way. Um, do you guys have any idea on how this might change our world in the future? Well, you know, I certainly think it's a creative idea, and, you know, I thought it was interesting how the article stated that um, the further down the economic pyramid you start, you know, using, in like, in like encouraging the use of these technologies, it will be have more growth potential, you know. So, um, you know, I think it's, uh, you know, noble, a bold, you know, idea and you know it'll in definitely encourage you know especially for those poor areas in the world like China and India where you know they don't have basic you know needs met you know it'll be definitely useful and you know the only challenge I guess would be trying to you know get those technologies provided at a really cheap cost so that you know they can eventually sort of spread to the de developed worlds in the future. I'd just like to add that um, I feel like it really could change the world for our future mm -hmm. if these new technologies were implemented sustainably and mm -hmm. these developing countries could be used as models for sustainable growth 
And so if these new technologies were green technologies, um, we could uh, use them to develop these countries sustainably mm -hmm. and the rest of the world hopefully would follow. Mm -hmm. And so we focus on them and not the developed countries as our leaders. And I guess it's one more step towards thinking more globally and mm -hmm. producing actions that are planet oriented. And so at that point, we would, for we would forget the concept of prestige of adopting something from developing countries and begin to think of solutions that, that can be more, well, let's say universally applied or would be in general be um, beneficial for the sustainability of our resources in the future. No, I, th I think it definitely could work and solve a lot of the problems, but we just have to get it started. And we're back to the collective action problem again, <laughs> as always. Who's going, to the, who's going to bear the costs of starting a trickle-up program? I mean, hopefully these companies will see the, the, the benefits of these new markets. Mm -hmm. And yeah, they're going to have to get rid of some of the costs and complexities in their, in their products. But over the long term, maybe they can see a profit. So mm -hmm. hopefully seeing a profit in the future will give them a little bit of incentive to, to start. <laughs> hopefully. Hopefully. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think it'll, there'll be momentum. There already is some momentum um, in the Western world to move towards towards technologies, like I was saying, that are more decentralized, that are um, you know, more alternative energy, that rely less on the infrastructure that we're so used to, the, um, whether it be the, you know, the roads, the pipelines, um, the big water system. So I think, I think there definitely is, is a demand there. Um, and it's, it's just going to take time to play out. All right, well, maybe this theory will develop further in the future and we're going to start seeing some changes, I hope. Mm -hmm. So finally, uh, a local story is the Arlington Recycling System. This new system allows for residents to not separate their recyclables, making it a lot simpler to recycle. Personally, I think this is a, this is a great system because it makes it easier for residents to recycle, thus it makes them more likely to do so. With us today to discuss this system is a special guest, Nicholas Wilson, a third grader at Key School Elementary. Welcome, Nicholas. Hi. So, Hi. so um, tell us a little bit about this new recycling system and what you think about it. I think it's good because um, you can res it's a lot bigger than the yellow bin when it gets noticed. A lot of times you go into the garage, you go into your, the place where you kept your trash can and you wouldn't even notice the yellow bins because they're too small. But the, these blue bins are almost as big as our, the trash cans. Um, and you can recycle just as much stuff as you can throw away because you have a lot more, you can recycle a lot more materials. All right. So, I mean, is this, have, are any of you Arlington residents, have you noticed that more people are recycling, or have you noticed more people recycling, or? More people are recycling, and the people who are already recycling, recycling more. Great. Yeah, I live in Arlington, too, and I can vouch for that. I definitely have started recycling more, and I haven't gotten quite to the amount of recycling that I, I would like, but it's definitely increased. Um, hopefully other counties will implement this kind of thing. I know that in Fairfax there are still the tiny bins, and, um, which is unfortunate, but maybe Arlington County can be a really good example. Another thing is that before these blue bins, people would just put like branches in the yellow bins and not really anything that you would really have to recycle. Maybe a few, maybe a bit of newspaper here and there, but I haven't seen anything else in the yellow bins besides some bits of newspaper and occasionally some cardboard. But now there's so a lot more. A lot more. Good. <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess the guidelines now are clearer and it's, you know, it's easier to tell what you can recycle. I mean, you can recycle so much, so much and you just don't even have to separate it. Mm -hmm. So much easier. I know some other counties have done this, have moved to the bigger bins in the past. Uh, but Arlington's not the first, of course, but it be nice if more counties started signing on to this idea. What do you guys think? <laughs> I think the commingling of... Go ahead. Not just counties <laughs> in the state, but if enough counties in the state do it, then counties in other states might start doing it. And it could spread to even, if it spread far enough, maybe even to other countries. Oh, it would have to spread really far. That's a bit unlikely. 
Oh, I think it's likely, but not necessarily in the likely short term. in the short time. No, it's probably more long term. But it's def it'll happen. Maybe the whole country will be a recycling country, which is and maybe like the and maybe like the other countries like Mexico and Canada near the borders. They might start doing it. Then it would spread it to the other parts of it. Hopefully, mm -hmm. and I mean, it's also it's not just recycling. If it spreads, it can become a mindset of reusing and sustainability and kind of keeping the earth clean. <laughs> This, this kind of connects with our previous topic. Um, some, some countries, uh, like I especially think of some examples in India where they're very good at recycling. Um, they're very good at taking things that uh, a lot of us would just throw away and making it into very cool things. <laughs> I have a little coin purse that's made out of old wrappers uh, from Ghana. Wow. And uh, yeah, so a lot of this is kind of a tri trickle up effect that maybe could happen. Um, mm -hmm. I think there are a lot of maybe misplaced subsidies uh, <laughs> that must happen in the America especially um, that make it actually physically cheaper for us to throw things away rather than recycle. And so there are some policies that need to change, I think, to facilitate um, getting, getting uh, us to use, use these things that we typically throw away and to try to recycle them and reuse them. But also in India, I've well, they use dried up banana peels instead of wood to make fires, and they're just as good, sometimes better. A and so they don't have to throw away the banana pe peels or chop the wood. Picking bananas and eating them is a lot easier than chopping wood. That's true. Yeah, so it's easier on multiple levels, which is good. <laughs> and I mean, we know they're that better. wood is also a finite resource, and deforestation is happening. So maybe you know we can use our trash to keep us warm. So <laughs> it's good. Yeah, and I'd like, just to, I'd like to just mention something that Fadi mentioned earlier today, which is, you know, programs like this should really give the public a better sense of why we need to recycle and the benefits of recycling. And, you know, hopefully encourage them to take a further step, you know, in trying to live sustainable lives, so. Yeah, maybe this thing can probably encourage people to do composting in their backyard since they already have an added convenience and so they might be even more motivated to do things that will um, add to their sustainable lifestyle which is mm -hmm. our goal in, in the very near future i guess <laughs> I, I hope so um also if you like eat a fruit on, on eat like a fruit um on a picnic or something like that don't throw the peel out you, um, you could just put it on the ground. It'll degrade pretty fast and make the soil richer. Yeah, and that'll make more plants, and that'll make then then we'll have a better then a bit more plants, and then and then with those plants, once those plants die, it'll it'll get richer. It keeps getting richer. <laughs> yeah, I mean soil erosion is a problem, and we can help out any way we can, even after a picnic. So, <laughs> um, and also, I mean, I guess this is a really good example of if we make being green easier then people will do it. So maybe we should look at sustainability as how can we make it the easiest for people to do just in their own backyards. And so the cheapest. And the cheapest, yeah. It's definitely <laughs> something to consider, but yeah, we have to consider also the full life cycle of things and kind of add some education so that people understand um, why things are cheaper <laughs> and um, how to make things uh, easier. Yeah. Work, we have to all work together to make things easier. Well, thank, thank you, everybody, for your ideas. Thank you, Nicholas, for joining us today. You. And, um, you know, thank you for discussing. And hopefully all of you can join us next time when we discuss more current events um, as you see them. So thank you for watching News for Our Future. <laughs>